Good evening. I'm Don Rakow, the Elizabeth Newman Wilds Director of Cornell Plantations, and we're delighted to welcome all of you to our 2012 William Hamilton Lecture. This year, the lecture is not only honoring the late Dr. Hamilton, but also his close friend and colleague, Bill Dress. But before I make remarks about Bill Dress, I'd like to ask one of Bill Hamilton's longtime friends and associates and partners in horticultural crime, Jack Lambert, to make a few remarks. Thank you. Can you hear? Little did I know when I was an undergraduate at Cornell and took a course in zoology from William J. Hamilton, Jr., that I would still be a neighbor and friend of his many years later. We happened to live close to one another in Cayuga Heights. And he was a strong mentor in helping my late wife, Nina Lambert, develop her gardening skills. Later, she, along with, you've already heard mentioned Bill Dress, she and Bill Dress helped to establish the Hamilton Lecture Series. So, here tonight though, I'm really supposed to be mentioning something about Bill Hamilton's daughter, Ruth Hamilton Fisher. Ruth called me the other day from her home in New Jersey, saying she was very sorry she could not make the trip to this lecture, but she wondered whether I would stand in for her. I said I would. Uh, she had to just let me know what she wanted said. She said, it's very simple. All I want to say is how grateful I am to everyone involved in this lecture series that honors the memory of my father's life and work. I think all of us can add to that in terms of the lecture series, how fortunate we are in having this plantation lecture series that honors people and things. So here is to Ruth Hamilton Fisher. Thank you. As Jack was saying, Bill Hamilton and Bill Dress were longtime colleagues. And this year, the members of the Adirondack chapter of the North American Rock Garden Society have provided a gift so that we can, in particular, recognize Bill Dress, who was such an important member of the North American Rock Garden Society throughout his adult life. In addition to serving as a longtime board member and unofficial taxonomist for the Adirondack chapter, Bill in his day job was a full professor of taxonomy at Cornell uh, based in the Bailey Hortorium. So in addition to being an active gardener, one who was always ready to share both knowledge and divisions of plants, and being a very noted professor and author, Bill also owned a unique and wonderful property on the west side of town. And through his efforts, the town of Ithaca acquired Dress Woods, which is a 10-acre mature forest uh, bordering Culver Road on the town's west side that Bill Dress had long cared for. So how appropriate, given tonight's topic, that we are honoring Bill Dress, and we thank the Adirondack chapter of the North American Rock Garden Society for providing this opportunity to recognize Bill in this way. 
So before I mention, or before I ask um, Todd Bittner to come up to introduce tonight's speaker, I want to make sure that you're all aware that the next lecture in the Plantations Lecture Series, which is going to be given by Peter Hatch, who is the Garden Director Emeritus of Monticello's Gardens and Grounds, who will be speaking about the Jeffersonian tradition and about the restoration of the Monticello Gardens, that that lecture will not be given in this Statler Auditorium two weeks from tonight, but rather in the David Call Alumni Auditorium at the west end of the Ag Quad. So two weeks from tonight, as usual, 7.30 as usual, but in the Call Auditorium, not here at the Statler. So it was Ruth Hamilton who Jack Lambert just spoke about who first suggested to us that we bring Joan Maloof to Cornell to participate in the Plantations Lecture Series, and we are so grateful to Ruth for making such an extraordinarily good recommendation. And here to introduce Dr. Maloof is Todd Bittner, the Cornell Plantations Director of Natural Areas. Welcome and good evening. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Joan Maloof. As we once again enjoy the seasonal rhythms of autumn migration, brisk mornings, the hint of wood smoke in the air, the anticipation of magnificent fall colors, we are reminded of our shared love of the natural world and our growing concern for the conservation challenges faced today. Knowing that we only conserve what we love and we only love what we understand, Joan Maloof has been educating and inspiring students, audiences, and readers alike for many years. Joan began her studies of plant science at the University of Delaware, then earned her master's degree in environmental science at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, and finally her PhD in ecology at the University of Maryland, College Park. After a distinguished researching and teaching career at Salisbury University in Maryland, she more recently turned her focus to authoring books focused on natural area forests. Her 2005 book, Teaching the Trees, Lessons from the Forest, won an honorable mention from the Association of Study of Literature and the Environment. Her second book, among the Ancients, Adventures in the Eastern Old Growth Forest was published just last year. After traveling the nation inspecting remaining old growth forests, Joan founded the Old Growth Forest Network, dedicated to creating a network of forests across the United States that will remain forever unlogged and open to the public. We are very pleased to be bringing Joan Maloof to you tonight to talk about Earth's beautiful ancient forests can there be a happy ending? Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Joan Maloof. Good evening, everyone. So tonight I'm here to speak for the trees. Does that sound familiar? Who said that? Lorax, yay! We love Dr. Seuss's The Lorax because um, we know we need to speak for the trees. They can't speak for themselves. And there should be more spe people speaking for the trees. So we'll start out reminding ourselves about why trees are so special, why we love them so much. First of all, they are these amazing life forms that cannot move out of the spot they're in for their entire lives. They cannot speak for themselves. Their lifespans are so much greater than ours. Sometimes it's difficult for us to even imagine 
These things can be there for hundreds of years in one spot, taking whatever comes. Just looking at these images has probably lowered your blood pressure a little bit. <laughs> Trees also have been shown to speed healing. They reduce crime rates. They increase the value of real estate. They clean the air, not just by removing carbon dioxide, but also removing other pollutants. They clean the water. Let's see, what else do they do? Oh, shade, shelter from the trees themselves and also from the wood, this wonderful renewable resource that comes from the trees. Then they're home to so many other creatures that depend upon them. And here I've shown some of the um, larger ones, like the birds and the mammals, but so many tens of thousands of tiny little creatures depend on these trees too. And I was talking with someone the other day about um, trees and forests and why they're so wonderful. And, and this woman said to me, when I step into a forest, I feel completely different. And there's sort of a, a, a spiritual quality to forests that's difficult to put into words, but I know that you have felt it, something in the air. So we love these forests, but what are we doing to them? You know, these, these wonderful things that give us so much, and we are not treating them very well. Forest now covers 30% of the land, down from 46%. So this, this map here shows original forest cover about the time of the dawn of civilization. So think of the civilization starting in the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley. And just as that civilization got going is really when the forest clearing and logging began in earnest for trade. Also, I like to put this up here to remind ourselves that we are so fortunate to live in a forested part of the planet and not everyone is so lucky. In fact, there are 10 countries that have no forest whatsoever. So only 46% of our land had forests originally and every year that number gets smaller. And this particular um, image is 2005 is where this came from, but it's the only one that I had to compare the original versus something close to current time. And the data and statistics are kept now by the United Nations. And you can look online and you can see the um, FAO organization of the United Nations does a pretty good job. Every five years they come out with a new report and every five years it shows that we have lost more of our forest cover. Most of it was lost from clearing due to, for agriculture and for grazing. And in a lot of those places, those forests will never return because conditions were so marginal there. Think of the Middle East. Nowadays, we, we look at um, images of Iraq and Iran, places like that, and we think of them as very desert-like. Those places used to be covered with forests. Same with Italy. Look at the changes in Europe from then and now. So this is a reduction in forest quantity, but we're also going to talk about forest quality tonight. These images were taken in Maryland where I live, but the same sort of thing is going on in many places, including in our western states. What's happening is forests that have returned after being cut once 
and our now native and our native mixed forests are being logged and converted to plantations of species. In this case, it's loblolly pine, but um, depending on where you live, it could be a different species. And how do we keep other trees from growing there besides the ones that are wanted for the plantation through the use of herbicides? And I see this with my own eyes all the time. And the biologist E.O. Wilson says, when you convert and mix native forests to plantation, you lose 95% of the species there. So this is the quality reduction. As far as the forest statistics go, these are both forest cover, no problem. We haven't lost forest cover, but we know we have lost quality and we've lost all those other species. And when this forest gets logged, it's not going to go back to a native forest again. It's going to go back to plantation again. So it's like when we lose these native forests, we're losing them as far as we can see into the future. Okay, This is the same forest again. I want to talk about it a little longer. Doesn't look at, like anything special, right? No. Now this is across the road from me. I've visited this forest many times and I always thought, well, nothing special. You know, it's about 80 years old. The oldest trees in here are the pine trees because those are the ones that come in first after clearing because they can take full sun. And then later come in the oak trees and there's white oak and red oak and black oak and willow oak, there's beech, there's holly, there's dogwood, there's black gum, sweet gum, maple. A native mixed forest. <clears throat> I didn't think it was anything special until I realized how many of these we were losing. And I realized that in the past, our beautiful mixed old growth forests had been removed and nobody said, stop here, not one more, in so many of the areas. And I started realizing that it was going to be up to us, up to me, to say, stop, not one more. This forest is not old growth now. It's really nothing special, but you know what? It could be. It could be the seed of the healing that we need to get back some of those old growth forests. So how do I do this? And, and by the way, this is a public forest. This is a county park land, and it is planned to be cut and converted to pine because that's what the industry does there. And that's what the foresters told the park managers that they should do for the income. So being a scientist, I naturally turn towards science and I think, I'm going to design a study that's going to show why this is not a good idea. Let's see, I could, what will I use? Maybe mosses. I will study the mosses in these native mixed forests and I will show how there's so many more moss species in this forest than there will be in the pine plantation. Or maybe I would do spiders. Say, we know there's going to be more spiders in this native mixed forest than the other forests. Or maybe snails. And as I was thinking about my study that I was going to design, I realized that it would probably take about two or three years to complete the study, and if it was a really good one, I would get it published maybe somewhere like Ecology, which is an excellent journal. And then what, right? What difference is that going to make? Is that really going to save this forest? Now, I do believe in science, and I think that the data that scientists come up with is very important, 
but I did not think it was going to save this forest. I think that would have been just another paper on the pile telling us things that we already know are important in a way. So I thought I would take a different approach and perhaps write something for more of a general audience that could explain why our native forests are so important. And so I started writing essays about the interrelationships of the organisms that were living in this forest. Things like um, why the, the fungi that grew on the beech leaves helped with the beech drop plants that then had an effect on the flying squirrels that then affected the salamanders that lived here and just tried to weave all these interrelationships together and show that when you cut this forest, you're not just removing the trees, you're removing all these other organisms too that depend on the trees. And wrote essay after essay, and by the time I got to about the seventh essay, I said, hmm, I think this is a book. And so that's then what became my first book, Teaching the Trees, that they have out there. And my very first call from someone I didn't know from the general public was a woman named Ruth Hamilton Fisher. <laughs> and she called me from her home in New Jersey, and she said, you got it. And I know that she also had it because she got it from her father, William Hamilton, who taught here for many years and taught about those relationships. And she was raised learning those relationships. And she was living in Cape May, New Jersey, then defending the forests in her community. And she said, how can we get this book into the hands of the politicians and the people that need to read it. And I said, well, you could buy a bunch of copies and give them to them. <laughs> and she did. Every once in a while, I'd get an envelope with some cash, and she'd say, send me six more, or send me eight more, or send me four more. And she would put these into the hands of people that she thought should read it. So thank you, Ruth, for that. And she also invited me to my very first book reading lecture that I gave in Cape May County, New Jersey. So that's our history together. And now here I am at Cornell where her father taught. So it's a beautiful, complete cycle there. So this forest, I'm not quite done talking about this forest though. So let's think about this forest in a deeper time sense. What was on this spot 400 years ago? That would have been an old growth forest, like 95% of our eastern states would have been. And we know that because those early explorers wrote and told us about these cathedral-like forests. that were an amazing experience to witness. And what a wonderful resource was there. And those forests were cleared. And then this became an agricultural field. And then that field was abandoned. And then the native tree species grew up. And so here, in, I see the seeds of hope and healing that there can be recovery if we say, let's stop and let this heal. Now, I wanted to experience some of these old growth forests in the East for myself. When I first started asking around about this back in the 70s and the 80s, I was told that they were all gone. I couldn't 
believe that nobody had said, stop, let's wait some more. But then in the 90s, I started hearing rumors that it wasn't all gone. It was almost all gone, but it wasn't all gone. That there were little bits here and there of our eastern old growth forest that still existed. I'd seen the western, I'd seen the redwood, that's nice, but I wanted to see our forest. So I got myself to a few of these. I did some research, found out where they were. And I went to one in Maryland. It was just a little 14-acre piece, but it was a revelation to me. And I wrote about that forest in the first chapter of the book, Teaching the Trees. And that chapter is called Old Growth Air, because what I experienced in that forest was this air that I realized that was coming from the trees. Trees emit chemicals from their leaves. And by inhaling that air, I was actually taking those chemicals into my body, into my lungs, into my bloodstream. The trees were becoming a part of me. And I, when I gave my talks like I gave in Cape May, I got one question over and over and over again from the people that attended the talks. And that was, how do I get to that forest? <laughs> they all wanted, they gave me a side, can you tell me how to get there? They wanted directions to the forest. And I realized that people are hungry to see these places. And there really wasn't a good source out there that brought it all together to tell where they were and how to get there. And so I thought, I'll give the people what they want. Right? I will visit one forest in each of the eastern states, one old growth forest, and give directions for how to get there and tell them what I experienced in the process. And that's my second book that we don't have out there today, but, but it is available through Amazon and all that. So I'm going to tell you, um, show you a few pictures here, what I experienced, a few of my favorites. Cook Forest in Pennsylvania. Has anybody here been to Cook Forest in Pennsylvania? Yay, the tree lovers. <laughs> this is great. Cook Forest is an amazing, it's over a thousand acres of original forest. And one, one of the things you learn going to these old growth forests are how important the coarse woody debris is. That's what ecologists call it. So not just the standing trees, but the trees that have reached the end of their life cycle and have fallen to the forest floor are very important habitat. And they're like stores of nutrients that are released slowly to the rest of the forest. So this, seeing a down tree is a good thing to a forest ecologist. And then the fungi, amazing fungi in these forests things I'd never seen before anywhere else. And this tree right here, anybody know what that was? That was an American chestnut. So here is a forest where they didn't salvage log to take out the chestnuts as they were going. They left this forest alone. And because of that, we can see what part they played in that forest. And in fact, they're still playing a part because they still contain nutrients and there's still habitat for other organisms there. This is in Maryland. And the standing snags, also so important to the forest ecosystem because that's habitat for other species up off the forest floor, away from predators. And the fresh water, even during times of drought, in a lot of these forests, there was still abundant water because of the way the forest floor holds that water like a sponge and releases it slowly. Places where you could hike for days, not hear any cars, not see any other people, really get that sense of wilderness, even in the east. Congaree National Park. Has anybody in here been there? 
Okay, great. The fabulous bald cypress trees, the tallest forest in the southeast United States, place where seven species of woodpeckers live, where they're still looking for the ivory bill. Beautiful. Anybody been Porcupine Mountains? Yes, you've been to lots of these. Great. You guys win some prizes. I should bring some prizes <laughs> to hand out. Uh, just magical. You, know, you can lay under a 400-year-old hemlock tree watching a hummingbird pluck spider web for its nest. These intact ecosystems, all the pieces are still there, and they've been left alone. So I learned some, had some magical times, learned some wonderful things, but then I also learned the sad story about what happened to our eastern old growth. Now these graphs were produced in 1925 by the then head of the U.S. Forest Service, the first head of the U.S. Forest Service. And this map says area of virgin forest, 1620. So that term virgin forest, we don't really use that so much anymore. A lot of people think it's patriarchal. So uh, we prefer something like primary forest or original forest. You hear me using old growth forest. These are forests that are allowed to develop on their own to their maximum extent without being disturbed. So this was our great eastern forest. There would have definitely been some clearings in there the Native Americans made for food or for their villages. There would have been places that forest fires had gone through. There would have been some blowdowns. So there, it was not without disturbance. But the majority of it was with large, older trees like we imagine an old growth forest today. And just about, just as soon as the European settlers arrived, the cutting began. And even on the Mayflower, they were told, well, after you guys land and get off, load some wood in the hole and send it back. Because already other nations had cut the majority of their forests and were worried about running out of wood. And so a lot of our trees were exported back across the water to Europe also for other island nations where they needed wood to make casks. Much of it was used right here, iron smelting, railroads, houses. A lot of it was just burned to get it out of the way. This is 1850. By 1920, that had, the logging had really spread to the western states. And we don't have a graph newer than this, because these were made in 1925. But I can tell you from reading the accounts that the cutting of the old growth continued through the 30s, especially the 40s. World War II was used as an um, excuse for a lot of logging of these old growth forests through the 50s, through the 60s. We continued to lose old growth forests until now in the east, the estimate is 0.2% left. In the west, the estimate is 5% left. So we have not done such a good job at saying, you know, not all of it, save some of it. So forest cover, you know, the forest cover is not 2%. This is forest cover, but again, we are talking quality, not just quantity. This is from Connecticut, but this is pretty typical of a pattern that you'd see in a lot of the eastern states where 
Here, here's our 1620, the 95% old growth. These are the original, beautiful primary forests and the cutting so quickly to by the 1800s, we had hit a low point. And the forest cover has come back. So if someone says to you, oh, but it's, don't worry, we have more forests now than we had 100 years ago. Yes, that's true. But not more than we had 400 years ago. And also, now this graph only goes up to 1998, but um, in many of the eastern states, we're star it's starting to slip again. And we're losing forest cover again. And also, these forests aren't forests that are going to be just left alone. These are a lot of the forests that are in the logging rotation that I'm talking about. So the sad news is that the, a lot of the best of the best is gone. Doug, Doug firs, white pines, redwoods. And it got me thinking on my journeys about the next generation. Because our generation, a lot of the people I run into say, oh, I grew up playing in the woods. I love the forest. And then I wonder about this generation that's plugged in. Will they have that same relationship with the forest? And if they don't, how can we expect them to be the ones to say, no, not here, don't cut again, let's let some recovery happen? Do many of the next generation even realize what the land they're standing upon used to be? What percentage of the students, even at Cornell, know that the ground where this campus is used to be covered with old growth forest. And how are they going to know that if they don't have any places to see, to tell them what that land could look like, used to look like? Places where they can breathe in the trees. Now for my journeys to the old growth forest, this is the map I used where I marked a lot of the forests I was going to. And I, I'm driving for hundreds of miles between some of these forests. And I'm thinking, these children will never get to see these places in most cases. They may never get to see an old growth forest in their entire life. So this is where we say, the people before us didn't say stop no more. But instead of blaming them that we can't see more of these forests, what are we going to do? Because it's still happening, right? That forest across the street from me, if we let that go, we, it's on our watch that that's happening. So in start, in Julia Butterfly Hill, who I've heard her talk, and she says when you point a finger at someone, you have three pointing back at you. So what can we do? This is our problem now, or our success for the next generation. So I started wondering about this. What can we do for this, that next generation? So I thought, you know, it's not enough to wave your hands and say we need to save forests. It needs to be something more concrete than that. That hasn't worked. And in my journeys going state to state, I started thinking geographically, and I thought, well, one state is not enough. But what about one county? What if we saved one forest in each county from being logged again? then no child would be too far from any forest that would be maybe not old growth right now, because we don't have it in all the counties, 
but getting older every year and could mature with them and their children and the next generation. So out of the 3,140 counties, I estimated that 2,370 could support forest growth. The others were those in the, the plains or where it was too dry. And so, you might be thinking, this lady's crazy. <laughs> she thinks we're going to be able to save one forest in every county. But I have gotten my inspiration from the ones that have gone before me that have dreamt of a better land. And here's some gentlemen got together and said, why can't we be independent of England. Why does the king have to own our white pine trees? These should belong to us. We should have control of this land. And one of the very first flags for independence had a tree on it to signify that. They were dreaming of a better land. And who could they ever have imagined what America is today? I don't think so. Then there are the people who first had the dream of the national parks. The people that went to Yosemite and Yellowstone and said, we can't let this place be mined for its minerals. We can't let this place be turned into an amusement park. We need to have places that belong to all Americans, places that we protect. A small group of people. They had to lobby, they had to get money, they had to go to government, and look what they've done. Could they have imagined our national park system now and all the people that work in it? Then came the Forest Service, because as I just described, it was just cut, cut, cut right across this country. And some people realized that this is not a good thing, this cut and run. We're going to cut all our timber out of this country, and this is a wonderful resource. We need to make sure that some of these forests are kept in forest and manage in a sustainable way, although they didn't use that word then. And the federal government should buy some of these lands and make sure they stay in forest. And that was our US Forest Service. And I am grateful for that today, that we have that, that those people had the foresight and worked for that. But some people, like John Muir, and Aldo Leopold and Bob Marshall said, it's nice that we have these national forests, but there should be some places that are left alone where nature rules. They're not parks covered in roads, and they're not forests that are logged. The, we need wilderness areas. It took 40 years for the Wilderness Act to be passed in 1964. But now we have areas in our nation that are set aside. It took a lot of work. Recently, I found out, to me, playgrounds were always just there. They were a given. I didn't realize that there was something called the playground movement. People had to get together and say, the first playground was, um, a, it was a dump load of sand in Boston in the 1880s. And it was so popular that they started doing it other places. Then the playground movement got hold, and people lobbied the government, and people raised money, and communities started building playgrounds. And now look at the playgrounds. It's just so American. So we can keep dreaming of a better land. And so that's what I'm trying to do. This, I, I think of this as America's next idea, the Old Growth Forest Network. 
one forest in each county protected from logging and open to the public. And here's how we do it. County by county, we look for a good example. If old growth is there, great. That's the one that we will put in the network so people can find it. If not, we'll take something as mature as possible and mature and native as possible. Protected from logging, you would be amazed at how many of the forests remain even if they're in a park, they're not legally protected from logging. So try to get some protection from logging if it's not already there, open to the public so we can visit it, so our children can visit it, have a relationship, relatively accessible for the same reason, a place to park, a trail. And if there are a number of forests that could work, we go for the one that gives you that, that feeling, that special feeling that you are in a wild place, relatively wild. So I started forming this organization about 15 months ago. And January 1st, we opened for business, if you want to call it that. With my board, we started our books January 1, and I I'm happy to say that the network is growing. I'm going to show you. We had our very first dedication in April. This is one of the counties that Cook Forest is in. And Cook Forest is so large that it covers parts of two counties. So we have one in the county next door. And we are act, we're acting like trees. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> Here's our sign that we put up, and then we put on websites directions so people know how to get to these places. This is one in Dorchester County, Maryland. I have county coordinators that help me with each of these. I can't do all this myself. Here's our county coordinator for that forest. July, I got one in Hawaii on the Big Island. Beautiful, perfect old growth forest. Even the people that lived around there didn't know where it was. So part of this is just bringing all these forests of different ownership together in one place so people can find out where they are, so they can experience them. And so we can all work together to help ensure protection for these forests. And there's my county coordinator there, Evan. August in Virginia. These aren't all of them, I'm just showing you a few. And tomorrow, <clears throat> tomorrow we are dedicating the Fisher Old Growth Forest, which is owned by Cornell in Tompkins County, into the Old Growth Forest Network. <laughs> Thanks, Todd, for his help with that. And then the next day, and then later that day, I'm going to Cortland County and dedicating forests there. And then the day after that, I'm heading up to Hamilton County, not doing a dedication yet, but doing some exploration with some forest people there, and also in Essex County. So we are doing it. We are creating the Old Growth Forest Network. And as you might imagine, just like with the national parks and things, I am not going to be able to do it by myself. And so if you want to become involved, I have some on my back, on the table back in the, um, outside the auditorium there, I have some white cards that, I call them supporter cards, because um, as one of my board members says, we are not just a network of forests, we're a network of people and we're people that care about forests. And so we have to support each other in this. And I have 500 supporters already. And so if you give me your name and address, I'll consider you my supporter. So you can um, get on my mailing list that way. You can go to the website and sign up for our newsletter. You can donate, that would be very nice. Or if you have any contacts, 
with any foundations or even know a forest or want to be a county coordinator yourself, I welcome you to join in the Old Growth Forest Network and help me with this. And the next generations will thank you and us for our work. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Happy to answer a few questions, and I have a microphone. So. <laughs> this gentleman here. Those of us who grew up uh, during the environmental um, renaissance in the 70s and adored the Lorax and, and learned the lessons from those books thought if we could just, uh, how wonderful it would be if we could just have hands off of all our forests and let them age into a wonderful primordial state, um, and we'd have these wonderful primordial forests all over the place. However, we've discovered that because we currently have a middle-aged forest of almost the same age across large landscapes, we have a forest that's becoming increasingly susceptible to disease epidemics spreading through, to uh, insect invasion, to invasive species coming in. So what we really, I, I agree completely with, with, your, with the idea of the network and that we do need to save some of these forests, but the real goal is to get a diversity of ages of forests across our landscape. Mm -hmm. That would be a much healthier forest. So I'm mm -hmm. interested in what your, your reaction to that is. Yes, I absolutely agree with you that um, we do need a diversity of ages of forest across the landscape. And I have no problem with silviculture and having you know, some of our forests staying younger and being in silviculture. But when I look at that, um, that variety of ages that we need, the part that I see missing there is that piece of the older forests. So I feel like that's the piece that's going to be the most difficult, and the most time consuming to recover. And so that's the one that I'm working on making sure that happens. But you're right. And as far as those other things like invasive species, these forests are owned by all different entities. There's the one owned by Cornell. There's some that are part of our federal system, some state, some county, some private organizations, some land trusts. And so they're all going to have their own goals for the forest. Some of those manage for things like invasive species, and um, insects and others are very much hands off. So we don't get involved beyond saying no logging of this forest. You do what you think is right as far as management of this forest, but let's not start at zero. I wonder if you know about the small forest in, uh, it, it's part of the George Landis Arboretum in Esperance, New York, Do not along know. Route 20. That was given to the Arboretum several years ago by a young man who had inherited it. I don't think it's very large, and I've wanted to go there, but nice. I haven't been able to. But that's one small. Uh -huh. Ancient forest. Thank you. And um, so some of you might have forests in your mind, too, that you want to share with me. So I would urge you to um, write on the back of the card out there, and I'll take those, and I will research each of those forests. I presume you've read American Canopy? I have not. Oh. I can't lie. Oh. It's been recommended yeah. to me, and it's next on my list, yeah. but I have not read it yet. The other thing, do you know how Clarion got its name? No. The trees were so tall that the winds were rustling through the trees. Ah, the clarion call. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a critical minimum size for old growth stands that you want to preserve? 
Um, no, is the answer to that. And, and <clears throat> when it comes to forests, the bigger the better. Yeah, and we know that. But given that, like, there is a forest in a county near me, Talbot County. Oh, the one that I described in my first chapter in the book, Old Growth Air. That forest, the 14 acres. That 14 acres is the last piece of old growth forest on the whole Delmarva Peninsula. And so you can stand in the middle of it and you can look out, you know, and see the farm field out there and the farm field out there. But I decided to include that in the network just because it was true old growth and it gave people a taste of the, at least the size of the trees, even though at 14 acres wasn't really ecologically intact. So that's my smallest so far. Hopefully it's the smallest ever, but who knows. Okay, maybe time for one more. One more. Yeah. I actually wanted to uh, echo that previous question because one of the things I was thinking about um, on, about um, maybe a, a year or two ago, I was watching a PBS um, documentary about forests in the Amazon. And one of the things that they were talking about is the importance of a continuous forest. Mm -hmm. How when a forest is isolated, then it's exposed to the invasive species. That's right. Also the migration of animals, seeds, you know, mm -hmm. how important it is to have that continuation. So what I sit here uh, thinking um, is, what are we gonna do when we look at these maps of what's happening all over the world because now we have what's called globalization. So we might be protecting something here, mm -hmm. but meantime, somebody else's forest is being deforested and that product is coming here. The houses are also getting enormously bigger. People are living in these mansions. And um, so I, I, don't, I don't know, and I'm also thinking of the Amazon a lot because the Amazon, um, is, is such an important, the way all our forests have been important, mm -hmm. but that's slated for massive destruction now with Brazil getting more modern. And just last night I was thinking about this because on uh, C CSNBC, they were replaying a 60 Minutes program that I saw and how China is now investing so much in, in you know, in Brazil. No, no, I'm not saying that we're not, but the deforestation mm -hmm. of the Amazon. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely right. This is a global problem. This is not just a US problem. This is a global problem. Really, my network should be global. <laughs> I think I've got my hands full <laughs> with what I'm doing right now. But we need people all over the world to care about this. And, and, um, and also the resources and how we use the resources, you know? just. Little things like, you know, if you get a newspaper, make sure to recycle your newspaper because the, that wood is coming from somewhere. Also, your point about um, fragmentation was right on. Uh, there are a lot of organisms that need vast expanses of forests to do well and to survive, and so we need unfragmented forests. Other organizations are working on that. There's an organization called the Wildlands Network and that's what they're trying to get, these contiguous corridors. So um, what I'm doing is not the be all and end all. It's not the best thing or the last thing out there. It's just the little bit that I feel like I can do and that's what I'm trying to do, speaking for the trees. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
Excellent. We will see you there then. Thanks very much.